Tony Adams was the leader of the Premier League's most celebrated defence. Cajoling, inspiring and leading by example. He was the on-field figurehead of a revolution at one of England's most traditional clubs. is a legend of the Barclays Premier League. He made his debut for Arsenal at 17 and was captain at 21. He was born to it, eventually making more than 500 league appearances and playing 66 times for England. I think he got into the first team when he was 17, made his debut. And even David O'Leary said, um, normally when a younger player gets into the side, you have to nurture him, you have to um, sort of advise him what to do, where to go, and you have to, have to talk him through it. It was the other way around with Tony Adams. He went straight in when he was 17, and he started dictating to David O'Leary. And then all the senior players, the likes of Viv Andersons and the Kenny Sampsons, knew that he had a lot of ability and could see that in training. And then your test is when you go into the first team environment. And uh, as a younger player, do you, do you shrink or do you thrive on that responsibility? And right from the age of 17, I think Tony thrived on the responsibility. Holston laying it forward, hoping that a cuckoo could make something of it. And no nonsense defending from the Arsenal skipper, Tony Adams. Although he was young in, eight, in years, he was the leader. He, you know, he radiated something for everyone else and it drew, it drew everybody to him. And uh, when you witness something like that, you know, it, 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 it really is special, and he's a special player, he's a special person as well. He was one of them sort of characters that he, he was, you could tell he was a born leader. I think George Graham, straight away, at 21, year old, 21 years old, knew he could give him the armband as, as captain, and he would have been the driving force of that team. Well, Tony Adams playing a captain's part back there. There are some men who might not be playing tonight with that uh, stitched up ear of his on the left side, but... Um, he doesn't worry about things like that. Stitches or no stitches, he ploughs on. He led by example. Um, he'd uh, lead by example on uh, defending set pieces and in general play and putting his head where you know he, he thought he'd get a kick in the face. If you asked me to put a mental picture together of Tony Adams playing, it wouldn't be hitting striking passes, it wouldn't be uh, scoring great goals, it would be of him pushing and pulling people around the pitch. I was lucky enough to play quite a few times in England with him when he was when he was captain and stuff, and uh, it was just an inspiration, really. You knew what you were going to get from Tony Adams. You knew you were going to get 100%. Very rarely have a bad game, um, and to to have somebody like that lead you out actually lifts you as a player. When I first started playing, he'd, he'd been obviously playing for England for quite a few years before me, and he was the dominant voice that I heard, um, always encouraging you. Um, him during the game, always, always helping you. He, he wasn't having a great game. He was very demonstrative in the dressing room before he went out. It was, uh, I think Terry Butcher was his hero, and he was like the cage lions and tigers, let's go out there and you know, get amongst them, and he'd punch the wall and he'd headbutt the wall to get himself psyched up. It was always Tony you would hear in the last few, few minutes before going out to really get the boys up. Uh, you know, when he spoke, you listened and you followed. It's as simple as that. He was a fantastic leader. Don't look at the player, look at the package and start with leader. He does the ritual beforehand, shake your hand and pat you on the back and then kicks you. That's, I think, that's the best way to describe him, you know. Off the pitch is your mate, on the pitch, you're his enemy. Adams very quickly into the challenge and Ferdinand stays down. He could tackle very, very well. Uh, he was a very solid, you know, people said, you know, he wasn't the quickest centre-back, but he read the game pretty well, and um, I, I would suggest that probably 99% of the tackles that Tony went in for, uh, he came out the other side um, on top, and uh, yeah, he was an outstanding defender. Upped on by Goss. Sutton is being very, very closely patrolled indeed by Tony Adams and Steve Bold. I mean, bearing in mind I started in the days when you could tackle from behind and, you know, you certainly knew when you played against Tony Adams, you'd, you'd sort of, ball's being hit up, you'd try and get hold of it, or get your body in, and then, you, you know, you'd maybe uh, carry them ahead for sort of a second, and by the time I got to the second, you know, I was probably lying on the floor in a heap. 
Chris Sutton is hurt. And this is how. Tony Adams, the culprit. He'll do what he needs to do to win. And if it means going through you, that's what he done. Um, but the thing is with Tony, you know it's there's nothing personal involved in it. Adams under pressure here from Cole. Alan here was a malicious uh, defender. He would go in very hard and very strong, and I was on the receiving end a few times. Um, but I always thought, you know, he wasn't one of those that you thought was definitely going in to try and hurt you. Uh, he was all about winning the ball, um, and you know, if he if he happened to uh, to have to take the man at the same time, it was never in. A, I didn't think it was ever in a malicious way. Throughout his career, Adams battled alcoholism. I have immense admiration for Adams because he confronted his inner demons, demons that had seen him locked away at Her Majesty's Pleasure at one stage. He went to prison, obviously, in uh, 1990 um, for his uh, drink-driving case, and I think he got a three-month sentence and he served a month, and prison can change a lot of people. And when he came out, he was a changed man, but I think he'd probably had time to reflect on, you know, um, where his life was going, his career was going. And emerged with great dignity and poise and emerged a better human being, a better footballer. Um, he benefited from Arsene Wenger's new scientific methods, which meant, for a start, no alcohol. Arsene Wenger changed that completely, made it a completely alcohol-free bar, where it used to be a free bar when I was there, um, which was quite handy to be fair <laughs> after the games. Um, but he made it what they called a dry bar, um, made the senior players, the Steve Bowles, the Tony Adams, the Lee Dixons and Nine at Winterburns realise that if you looked after your body better and you cut the alcohol out, you could prolong your career. And I think that's probably when the, you know, he had uh, sort of this epiphany where he thought, right, if I want to um, prolong my career, um, I'm going to have to cut out that way of life. I, I mean, that's his character, you know, he's, he's, he's very strong-minded, very strong-willed. You know, there's not many people who can actually, you know, go through what he's been through. I mean, he's been through a lot as Tony and come out the other side still had a smile on his face still you know telling people what to do still is giving people the right instructions and still leading by example I think you know that really does show the mark of the man he was part of that formidable Arsenal backline um, you know he Steve Bold and, and the Dixon and Winterburn on the and the fullbacks they were just not nice to play against you know and you think one of them one of them was out and Martin Keown would come in and you think oh God uh, I'm in for a tough day today and now it's down to Espria Bold doesn't know quite which way to go but he's holding him up well and then his longtime colleague and partner in crime Adams did the rest. I would have loved to have played in that back four because they knew exactly what to do. It was instinctive and the way they played together. And I think that's why, looking at the age that they then played too, because there was such a good understanding there. You know, a lot of the time, the first yard was always in their head. I don't think they were just the most famous back four in, Ar in Arsenal's history and Premier League. I think they were the best back, domestic back four that this country has ever seen. Individually, they might not have been the best in their positions. Tony Adams may arguably, um, obviously, had a very successful England career. I think he had 60 caps. Whereas if you look at Lee Dixon, he probably had 20. Nigel Winterburn, probably, you know, 10, 15. Uh, I think, think Steve Bowl was probably one or two. Um, but it's the way they play together as a unit. Support this time. Hughes, Adams stretching. Keo. Good defending by Tony Adams again for Arsenal. Opposition teams knew that if we scored, then virtually that was game over. It was a great psychological um, tool to have because you could see that it actually deflate the opposition. As soon as we scored, you know, the reputation went round is this back four doesn't um, concede goals. <laughs> If I was an England manager, we had Dave Seaman, England's goalkeeper as well, I'd have played that back four. Because when you're meeting on international duty, you haven't got to work anything. You've got your back four, they all know each other, they've all got an understanding. So play them as a unit. Then it, I don't think it ever happened. But I do remember when Robbie Fowler scored a fastest hat trick of all time at Anfield against that back four and made Tony Adams and his friends look stupid. Scored a hat trick in three and a half minutes. Magnificent. For a time, he was even a feature of the showbiz pages. We was amazed by that. I couldn't believe. It. I've roomed with Tony for ten years, and you know, when he pulled Caprice, I was like, "How did you do that?" And he said, "I really," he said, "I don't know." We actually never 
saw him with Caprice and apparently they had the same agent which is you know, quite a coincidence. Um, so we used to, we used to call him um, Jack and Ori or a bit of a Billy Liar. Them days he'd give up, given up his drinking. He was a lot more sensible then. Um, and, he, and I think she really liked it, his mentality or his humour. I don't know how, but you know. He did like a tall story. We'd sit him down and you know, where he'd been the night before and who he'd been with. So we just took that with a, a pinch of salt. But to be fair, it's not, not bad on your CV because everybody still talks about it. But um, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't believe that too much if I was you. Tony Adams spent 19 glorious years at Arsenal, much of that time with his hand in the air. Brilliant skill. Giggs is offside. I won't count this. Offside. It's Giggs. York's offside. Just can't get that final ball right at the moment, Manchester United, can they? There's the upright arm when George Graham was manager as they all step forward in unison to claim yet another offside on, way to a, on the way to a 1-0 victory, inevitably. It was choreographed. It was, again, that was from, uh, from George Graham. Um, it went through the whole back four where we used to... Didn't really play an offside trap, but the way George Graham set the back four up, the, we defended um, quite a high line with the two full-backs pushed in front of the centre-halves, and it was the centre-halves who would play the offside because they knew for well that Nigel Winterburn and um, Lee Dixon weren't dropping in behind them. And it was ingrained in them that as soon as the ball was played forward and they thought that the um, opposition forward was offside, the whole back four would put their arms up. Even got mentioned in the film called The Full Monty that they all did the Arsenal trap and they had it off to a fine art. And what that actually does is, even if the linesman isn't sure, it makes them think, oh, it must have been offside. So the linesman, it's like Pavlov's dog, you actually do it automatically where you'll put your flag up if it's a borderline decision. And Chris Sutton looks even more important now. And offside. But he's offside. What a tight call that. I have to say it was very effective because there was probably um, hundreds of times during their career where uh, all four of them, the arms go up and uh, the linesman, I think, just automatically went, oh, Tony Adams has put his arm up, this must be offside. And up his flag went, and you go, well, it was about four yards on, what are you doing? They worked all week on it, I know. But equally, Adams was the, the leader of the offside trap and had the highest arm. <laughs> Arsene Wenger's arrival at Arsenal led to a new chapter in Tony Adams' career. Then Arsene Wenger turned up. Those, those same players who were sort of oppressed, in a way, into doing things regimented, got this freedom to, to express themselves that they've never had before. And, you know, that famous back four, that, you know, they were, they were revelling in it. If you think back to when he first started, you know, our centre-halves in England didn't play. What we did was defend, we tackled, we headed, and we made sure we stopped the other team playing. When Wenger came, he says, no, no, Tony, what we actually want you to do is pass the ball. He allowed the players to express themselves a little bit more, um, actually gave them more responsibility on the ball. People used to give him a lot of stick in his early days. Uh, Donkey Adams couldn't trap a bag of cement, whatever. But I think when Wenger came, he, he showed what a good player he was. He used to come out of defence and, you know, make forward runs and see him score a couple of great goals, one with his left foot. He was Tony even surprised Arsene Wenger at how good he was on the ball. And the biggest compliment I could play Tony is if he was in Arsenal's back four now as a centre-half, Arsenal would win uh, the Premier League. I do remember Tony telling me once when uh, Arsene Wenger first came to the club, um, told me about what happens on an away game. Now normally at that period on an away game we would get on the coach, travel two, three hours to the hotel, we'd meet seven o'clock for something to eat and off back to the room. Well, Tony was at pains to tell me, he says, you're not going to believe what Wenger's got us doing. I said, what's that? He says, we stretch. We get off and stretch. We've got to go into a room and stretch for half an hour. He thought it was ridiculous. Of course, a few years later, he thought, you know what? That was a wonderful thing that we did, and it made him uh, last that much longer. Under George Graham, he won two league titles. Under Wenger, he won two more, including the double in 2002 at the age of 35.
For a centre-half, Tony Adams knew how to score goals. 32 in the league alone, and none were penalties. He seemed to get on the end of things that sometimes he had no right to get on the end of. And, you know, to score 32 goals, that's... There'd be some strikers who'd be happy with 32 goals, let's be honest. Um, but, you know, he was very determined getting on the end of crosses off corners. And he was always hard to mark, Tony. We had, in them days, we had some good, good, you know, att people attack the ball. The likes of Stevie Bowles scored lots of goals, you know. Always the flick on at the front post as well. Martin Keown, when he played, went up and he was always aggressive in the, in the box as well. Uh, and he was very important, Tony, you know, he scored some really important goals for us. Tony had his most significant goal was um, the FA Cup semi-final against Spurs at, at Wembley. Uh, we, we played Spurs a couple of years before and uh, unfortunately got beat 3-1. Uh, so, you know, this was sort of like revenge time. Adam scored a few, I know where you're going. Adam scored a few and I was playing for Tottenham against Arsenal at Wembley in the semi-final of an FA Cup where I was picking up Tony Adams at the far post and he got above me and scored a goal to beat us 1-0 and knock us out the FA Cup where they went on to win it. So very bad memories about picking Tony Adams up. I particularly remember being in the, the, the bath after. And we had a beer when we sat down there and he was just, you know, was just closing his eyes, relishing the moment because it was, uh, it was a good payback. I would maintain that his best ever goal was scored on Boxing Day 2000 against Leicester City at Highbury and I was fortunate enough to be the commentator that day and he received the ball in his own half and gave the ball and then he started to run up the pitch and I thought well where's he going and the ball worked its way out to the right wing um, and Thierry Henry got hold of it and then I remember this figure still with number six on his back running out and I said and Adams is continuing his run what's going on? And what was going on was that Adams had seen this vision in his head that Henri was going to cross the ball to the far post and he met it so sweetly at the far post and swept in an outrageous half volley um, to celebrate Christmas a, a day late and Highbury stood open-mouthed at what their captain had just done, the fact that he'd run the length of the pitch to get on the end of a cross from Thierry Henri. It was sort of role reversal, really, and sweep in this magnificent goal. For me, that was my defining memory of, of Tony Adams. Oh, and it's Adams! They've scored in stoppage time at the end of the first half, and Derby have cracked. Tony was one of them sort of characters. He, was a, he, did, he never just stayed in one position. You know, sent half, all of a sudden you see him left wing. You think, well, maybe we're chasing the game. Uh, and he, that's the sort of character he had. We'd never give up, you know, if, if I, even if I have to score the goal. Derby got their marking wrong, and Adams came round the back and bulleted it past Holt and the league leaders lead today. Not only could he head the ball, he had a, he had a great leap, a natural jump where you know, most people six foot four couldn't jump, but Tony had a, had a great leap and just had to head the ball where he wanted to go, which was, which, which was great for them. It was horrible if he was trying to mark it. Driven in by Petit and Tony Adams towered above everybody else to get that accurate header in on target. And I think when the ball goes into the box, sometimes it's just the bravest and it's the one that really wants to get there. And if you wanted to get there, you know that Tony Adams' head was not going to be far away from you. So uh, I was glad I was on the post. Bolden Adams lurking inside that six-yard box. It's... The abiding memory of Tony on the pitch would be the, the memory of him coming for a, a, a massive group of players from, from corners, for, from attacking corners. We used to have the old Arsenal uh, corner where it was drilled into near post, Steve Bowl would flick it on, and then Tony Adams would come flying through a load of like boots and, um, and heads and elbows as if he'd been shot out of a cannon. And I can remember scoring a goal at Old Trafford as well like that. Obviously, he did it in big games. It's a goal which clinched Arsenal's first Premier League title in 1998 in a game against Everton, which has become his most iconic. Well, the Everton goal was, it was amazing. This is, the, this is the game we had to, um, to win the league uh, at Highbury. A beautiful day, it was perfect conditions, packed house, 
And uh, we, we, again, we was a little bit nervous because we got into a game. We was playing with so much confidence at the time. We shouldn't have been nervous, but we was because of the uh, importance of the game. Uh, and we seemed to, we seemed to over miles was on, on fire that day. I think he scored two goals. I think it was an own goal as well. So we, we know we're going to win the league now. This is a, it's probably a few minutes left. I can actually remember it quite vividly. Um, he picked the ball up from the halfway line. He exchanged the one-two with Steve Bold, who was our other centre half. And I've never seen that happen. I've never seen them two pass together before when I played. And Tony Adams, which he did do quite often, sort of galloped through the midfield. And we were thinking, where's he going? Everyone thought, well, he's got to start running soon because he's in uncharted territory. I mean, he hasn't got a map for this part of the pitch as he approached the Everton penalty area. And Steve Bowles just put a great little ball, timed at the offside like, like a dream. And, and he seemed to pop up to Tony, sort of chested it. And he looked like he miscontrolled it at the time. Uh, and then he hits it on half volley with his left foot and it flies in the top corner and we've... It was him saying to the crowd, I'm actually, other than a, a fantastic defender and captain, I'm a very, very good player, which we all knew anyway. What a finish and, and what a way to, to win the league is your skipper gets set up by your other centre-half uh, and puts him through and you win 4-1. And even, you know, even after the game, he's all saying, Tom, we didn't know you could do things like that. I would say that even given Tony Adams' amazing career, this might be the highlight. They wrote him off. They wrote Arsenal off. They wrote Arsene Wenger off. Manchester United had it won. And we were all so wrong. Barclays Premier League. He made his debut for Arsenal at 17 and was captain at 21. He was born to it, eventually making more than 500 league appearances and playing 66 times for England. I think he got into the first team when he was 17, made his debut. And even David O'Leary said, um, normally when a younger player gets into the side, you have to nurture them, you have to um, sort of advise them what to do, where to go, and you have to, have to talk them through it. It was the other way around with Tony Adams. He went straight in when he was 17, and he started dictating to David O'Leary. And then all the senior players, the likes of Viv Andersons and the Kenny Sampsons, knew that he had a lot of ability and could see that in training. And then your test is when you go into the first team environment. And uh, as a younger player, do you, do you shrink or do you thrive on that responsibility? And right from the age of 17, I think Tony thrived on the responsibility. Holston laying it forward, hoping that a cuckoo could make something of it. And no nonsense defending from the Arsenal skipper, Tony Adams. Although he was young in, eight, in years, he was the leader. He, you know, it, he radiated something for everyone else and it drew, it drew everybody to him. And uh, when you witness something like that, you know, it, 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 it really is special. And he's a special player, he's a special person as well. He was one of them sort of characters that he, he was, you could tell he was a born leader. I think George Graham, straight away, at 21, year old, 21 years old, knew he could give him the armband as, as captain and he would have been the driving force of that team. Well, Tony Adams playing a captain's part back there. There are some men who might not be playing tonight with that uh, stitched up ear of his on the left side, but um, he doesn't worry about things like that. Stitches or no stitches, he ploughs on. He led by example. Um, he'd uh, lead by example on uh, defending set pieces and in general play and putting his head where, you know, he, he thought he'd get a kick in the face. If you asked me to put a mental picture together of Tony Adams playing, it wouldn't be hitting striking passes, it wouldn't be uh, scoring great goals, it would be of him pushing and pulling. was the leader of the Premier League's most celebrated defence. Cajoling, inspiring and leading by example. He was the on-field figurehead of a revolution at one of England's most traditional clubs. Tony Adams is a legend 
of the bump people around the pitch. I was lucky enough to play quite a few times in England with him when he was when he was captain and stuff, and uh, it was just an inspiration, really. You knew what you were going to get from Tony Adams. You knew you were going to get 100%. Very rarely have a bad game, um, and to to have somebody like that lead you out actually lifts you as a player. When I first started playing, he'd, he'd been obviously playing for England for quite a few years before me, and he was the dominant voice that I heard. Um, always encouraging you, um, even during the game, always always helping you, even when he wasn't having a great game. It was very demonstrative in the dressing room before he went out. It was, uh, I think Terry Butcher was his hero, and he was like the cage lions and tigers, let's go out there and you know get amongst 